And they are unable to give them any help. Who? Those whom they associate with Allah. These beings whom you associate with Allah, whether it is a person, or a rock, or a tree, or the sun, or the moon, those whom you are associating with Him, they are not even able to offer you any kind of help. Notice the word Nasran. It is Nakira. Any kind of help. Whether at the time of birth, or at the time while the baby is developing in the womb of the mother, or after the baby is born, لا يستطيعون لهم نصرًا They cannot help themselves. They cannot offer any kind of help. ولا أنفسهم ينصرون Nor can they help themselves. So who are you associating with Allah? Someone who cannot offer you help, and someone who cannot even help themselves? If they cannot even help themselves, then how can they help you? When they cannot create themselves, then how can they create others? If they cannot help themselves, then how can they help others? And if you look at it, you can better defend yourself. You can better help yourself than they can help you. Especially when it comes to the matter of those who are dead or when it comes to the matter of idols. Like for example in Surah Al-Hajj, Ayah number 73, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example of idols whom people worship. That لا يخلقوا ذبابا They cannot even create a fly. And if the fly takes something from them, they cannot even take it back. ضعف الطالب والمطلوب Both are weak. The fly as well as the idol. Or both are weak. Who? The person who is praying to the idol and the idol himself is also weak. They cannot help one another at all. So who are you asking for help? Someone who cannot help you? Someone who cannot even help themselves? And it's so logical. And we can apply this to our daily life even. Who do we like to take help from? Someone who can actually help us. Isn't it so? If a little child comes and says, let me help you with your homework, what are you going to say? You're going to laugh. Right? So how can a person go before a rock that cannot even move by its own will and say, help me. When it cannot even defend itself, when it cannot even help itself, then how can it help you? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us, who are you associating with him? Someone who cannot even help himself. Then how can he help you? We learn that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he broke the idols and they were unable to defend themselves. In Surah Al-Safat, Ayah 93, we learn, فَرَاغَ عَلَيْهِمْ ضَرْبًا بِالْيَمِينَ Then he turned upon them, striking them with his right hand. Imagine, an idol is being beaten up. How can he help you? How is it possible? In Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 58, we learn about Ibrahim a.s. فَجَعَلَهُمْ جُذَاذًا إِلَّا كَبِيرًا لَهُمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِ يَرْجِعُونَ So he broke them into pieces, into fragments all except the biggest of them, that they might turn to it. And there are so many incidents in which we learn, for example, the story of Mu'ad ibn Amr ibn al-Jamuh, in which so many times the idol was taken from the father and was tied to a dog, thrown in the dump, thrown in the garbage, to show that this idol cannot even help itself, then how can it help you? وَإِن تَدْعُوهُمْ And if you call them إِلَى الْهُدَى To guidance. لا يتبعكم. They will not follow you. Who is this addressed to? This ayah has been understood in two ways. Let's look at the first meaning. That وَإِن تَدْعُوهُمْ The mushrikeen are being addressed. That if you call upon them, meaning if you call upon these idols, إِلَى الْهُدَى To huda, Meaning if you ask them for guidance, just as you ask Allah for guidance, if you ask them, for some benefit, لا يتبعكم They will not follow you. Meaning they will not follow your call. They will not respond. They will not answer your request. They will not fulfill your request. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It is the same upon you. أَدَعُوتُمُوهُمْ Whether you pray to them, أَمْ أَنْتُمْ صَامِتُونَ Or you remain silent. Whether you sit before them and you talk to them, or you sit before them silent. It's not going to make a difference. 
Why? Because they don't listen. Why? Because they cannot respond. They don't even know what you're saying. They don't even know who you are. They don't even know what you're asking for. And if they find out, they cannot even help you. Because they have no idea about what's going on. They're inanimate. They're non-living things. Then how can it help you? Secondly, this ayah has been understood as that wa in tadruhum the address is to the believers. That all oh, believers, if you call them, meaning if you call these idol worshippers, the mushrikun, ilal huda, to guidance, meaning to tawheed, tell them stop your idolatry, and come and worship only Allah. La yatabirukum, they will not accept this guidance. They will not accept this offer. سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It is the same upon you, O believers. أَدَعُوتُمُوهُمْ Whether you call them to guidance, أَمْ أَنْتُمْ صَامِتُونَ Or you remain silent and you don't call them. They will remain firm upon their shirk. They will not respond to their hate. Why? Because we learned earlier that إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنْزَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنْذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ They're never going to believe. Because when a person cannot understand simple logic, that this thing is made of stone. This thing is made of wood. I made it myself. It doesn't have any life in it. It doesn't have a heart that beats. It doesn't have ears that listen. It doesn't respond in any way. If a person does not understand simple logic even, simple logic, then how can you make him accept? How can you call him to guidance and how and why will he respond? He cannot. Notice the word Samitun. It's from the root letter Saad Meem Ta. And it's the plural of the word Samit. And Samit is to be silent. Basically it is used for someone who is silent and quiet natured. Someone who remains silent and hardly ever speaks. Hardly. Maybe he mumbled out a word or two. Maybe. Maybe he says one word. Maybe he will give a smile. But generally Samit is one who is silent natured. We learned another word for being silent. And what was that? Sakata. And what does sakata mean? To become silent after talking. So, am antum samitun or you remain silent? Inna ladina tadiruna min dun Allah. Indeed, those you call upon besides Allah. Who is being addressed? The mushrikeen. That, O mushrikeen, those beings whom you call upon besides Allah, whether it is a dead person, or it is an idol, or it is the sun or the moon, those beings whom you call upon besides Allah, what is their reality? They are ibadun, they are servants, amsalukum, just like you. Because everyone is a servant to Allah. وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ عَبْدًا In Surah Maryam, what do we learn? That every single one of them, every single creature in the heavens and the earth, is a slave to Allah, is an abd to Allah. Whether it is aqil or ghayr aqil, whether it is living or non-living, animate or inanimate, every single creature is a slave to Allah. So when they are just like you, فَدْعُوهُمْ So call them, make dua to them, go ahead, pray to them. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لَكُمْ Then they should respond to you. That if they're sitting right before you, they have eyes and ears and mouths that you have carved in them and beautifully painted. Then you call them and they should give an answer. They should respond. Especially if they're supposed to be God. They should respond to you. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are truthful in your claim, in your assumption, that they have the power to bring you any benefit or remove some harm from you. If you look at the word ibad that has been used over here, that those beings whom you call upon besides Allah, they are servants just like you. Ibad is a plural of abd. If you look at it, who is it that people call upon besides Allah? First of all, many people, they worship objects that are made of natural materials, so idols. And if you look at it, all of them are made of what? Wood, stone, mud, different types of things. And all of these things are possessed by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a person is worshipping the sun or the moon or some animal or some creature, all of them are who? Mamluk. They are possession of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
just as we are the Mamluk of Allah. Just as we are also slaves and servants of Allah. Secondly, who else do people call upon? Other human beings. Isn't it so? People call upon other human beings. Human beings that have been deified, that have been given divine attributes. That have been considered as deities. So they're being told over here that the idols whom you worship, they are of those people who were once upon a time human beings just like you. Isn't it so? Like for example, the people of Nur. Who did they worship? Idols and images. And they were made of who? Righteous people who came generations before them. But when they passed away, they made their images. Then eventually they began worshipping them. So, okay, you have an idol before you, you have an image before you, but what is it an image of? Of a human being, and that human being was just like you. Once upon a time, he lived on the surface of the earth, and now he's gone. Similarly, the people of Mecca also, they had made idols of human beings, righteous people, or even unrighteous people. All of these idols, Na'ila and Isaf and all of them, they were who? They were actually people who lived once upon a time. When they passed away, they made their idols and they began worshipping them. And literally, there are people who worship other human beings as well. Literally, they will go to their graves. They will do sajda over there. They will go and make dua over there. Literally, they will go and worship other human beings. Or there could be somebody who is living, alive, And he is sitting in the front and everybody is prostrating to him. Everybody is praying to him. This is all shirk. Because Allah says, those whom you call upon besides Allah, they are ibadun amthalukum. Whether it is human beings, or it is the angels, or it is the jinn, or it is some other creature, they are all creatures just like you. There are people who worship other humans. Literally they worship such as Ali r.a. They worship the Prophet wasallam. Literally, all of this is what? Pure shirk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَدْعُوهُمْ Go ahead and call upon them. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لَكُمْ And they should respond to you. That when you go to their grave, and you call them, then they should give a response. Not a response that you only heard. Because some people claim that, I heard the response. No. It should be a response that everybody can hear. Or a response that is quite visible, quite apparent. إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ If you are truthful. أَلَهُمْ أَرْجُلٌ Do they have feet? أَرْجُل is the plural of رِجُل And in this ayah in particular, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illustrates the incapacity, the utter incapacity of those who are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially the idols or other human beings who have passed away before. Who have passed away before. And people go and worship at their graves. So Allah demonstrates their utter incapacity and the fact that those who are calling upon them, they are superior to them. So how can you call upon someone who is less than you? How? Alahum arjulun? Do they have feet? Yamshuna biha that they can walk with? What do feet symbolize? Independence. When a person is able to walk, that shows that he is independent. So these idols whom you're calling upon, do they have feet with which they can walk? Maybe they have feet. Maybe they have multiple legs. Maybe they have multiple feet. But can they actually walk with them? Can they? No. Amlahum. Or do they have aydin, hands, plural of yad. Yabutishuna biha. With which they can strike and reach out. Can they move their hands? They cannot. What do hands symbolize? Power, ability. And the word yabtishun is from the root letters ba, ta, shin, batsh. And batsh is to lay hands on something with force, with quwa. And batsh is also a tight grip, to firmly grip something, to firmly seize something. Lay hands on something. So do they have hands with which they can strike, which they can lay on something else in order to get hold of it? No, they don't. Amlahum, or do they have a'yunun eyes yubusiruna biha with which they can actually see? Perhaps they do have eyes. And perhaps it seems as though they're looking at you because of the way that you've painted them. But 
do they actually see? Do they have eyes that are functional? No. Ayn is a plural of Ayn. And what do eyes symbolize? Perception, knowledge, ability, independence. Because one who cannot see, he becomes dependent on others. They are not independent at all. Am lahum. Or do they have adhanun, ears? Plural of udun. Yasma'una biha, with which they can actually hear. Do their ears function? What do ears symbolize? Again, perception, knowledge, ability, independence. They don't have any of this. Qul say, meaning, O Prophet wasallam, say to them, Udu'u shuraka'akum. Call upon your partners. Call upon your associates. Summa kiduni. Then plot against me. Fala tunliruni. Then do not give any respite to me. What does it mean by this? That O Prophet wasallam, tell these mushrikeen, that if their idols are really true, they're really those beings that have some power, they can listen, they can hear, they can respond, then tell the mushrikeen that they should pray to their idols and they should pray to their idols to destroy you. That tell them, pray to your shuraka to destroy me. Summa kiduni, then all of you, meaning you and your idols, make a plot against me. In order to harm me. فَلَا تُنْضِرُونِ And don't give me any respite. Meaning waste no time to harm me. Go ahead and try. And I'm telling you it's not going to work. Ask your idols to harm me. And it's not going to work. You may have heard the story of the boy and the king. It's a long story inshallah. We will learn about it in the 30th just inshallah. That in which the boy who had become a Muslim and he was showing different things to people to show to them that magic was untrue and what the king was preaching was untrue and they should only believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So what did the king do? He sent some people to kill the boy. And they took him to the middle of the sea. They took him up to the mountain. They threw him. They, they tried different things. They wouldn't be able to kill him. So he said, I will tell you a way through which you will be able to kill me. And what is that? That you say in the name of Allah. And when you use the name of Allah, then you'll be able to kill me. And the king did that. And by that, the boy died. But as a result of that, everybody believed. Everybody believed that it's only by the name of Allah that they were able to kill this boy. So what does it show? That the idols, the false gods, they cannot do any harm. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah who can harm or who can bring benefit. Now, over here we see that in every era, people have believed in idols in imaginary gods and they believe that these gods, these idols, they can cause some harm and this fear is instilled in the people it's instilled in the people and this fear is completely baseless and because of this fear the people worship idols that if we don't worship them they will harm us they will harm us for example at the time of Umar the Egyptians what they would do is that they would dress up a young girl and they would go and offer human sacrifice over there of that girl so that the Nile would produce more water or it would continue to run. So this was shirk. Now it's the fear that people have that if we don't offer such and such, if we don't worship, then this being, then this idol is going to harm us. And it's because of this fear that they continue to worship them. In Surah Hud, Ayah 54, we learn that the people said that in qulu illa ataraka ba'du alihatina bisu. We only say that some of our gods have possessed you with evil. Our gods have possessed you with evil. Qala inni ushidu Allaha wa shadu anni bari'u mimma tushrikun. He said, indeed, I call Allah to witness and witness yourselves that I am free from whatever you associate with Him. So this fear is instilled within people that if you don't worship them, they're going to harm you. However, this is completely baseless. So the Prophet ﷺ is being told to say to the mushrikeen, that tell them, pray to your gods, ask them to harm me, and don't give me any time, don't give me any time, any chance. Go ahead and try to harm me. You will not be able to harm me. If you look over here, just one side point, it says over here, قُلِدُعُوا شُرَكَاءَكُمْ And in the previous ayah as well we learned, call upon them. There are some people who claim to be Muslim and at the same time they call upon 
those who are dead in their graves. And they actually give evidence for that. And you know what the evidence they give? Udru shuraka'akum. Allah is telling us, Udru shuraka'akum. Now if you want to take something out of context and completely misquote it, then you can do anything. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us over here, Udru shuraka'akum? So that we do shirk? No. This is not the purpose. This is not the objective over here. What's the purpose? That go ahead, give it a try, call upon them, and see if they respond. They don't respond. So in other words, don't call upon them. Because shirk is completely baseless. Inna waliyi Allah. Meaning say to them, that indeed my guardian, my protector, is only Allah. Who is wali? Protector. One who protects, one who takes care of all of the affairs. All of the affairs. The one who is in charge. The one who helps. The one who supports. So my protector, the one who is in charge of my affairs, is who? Allah. And who is Allah? الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْكِتَابِ The one who sent down the book. Why? To guide people. وَهُوَ يَتَوَلَّ الصَّالِحِينَ And he befriends those who are righteous. People take other than Allah as wali. And they expect help from them. But what is the Prophet ﷺ told to say over here? That my wali is only Allah. I don't take other than Allah as my wali. He is only my wali. And I expect help and protection from him only. I only expect him to take care of my affairs. Why? Because he is الَّذِي نَزَّلَ kitab. He is the one who sent down the book in order to guide people, in order to guide us. Therefore, he is the wali. And those whom you call upon besides Allah, what guidance do they offer? What guidance do they offer? They don't offer any guidance. Allah is the one who offers guidance. Therefore, he is my wali. And if you want his help, if you want to be under his guardianship, then you must become salih. Because he only befriends who? As-salihin, those who are righteous. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 257, what do we learn? That Allah huwa liyu alladhina amanu yukhrijuhum min al-zulumati ila al-nur. Allah is the wali of the believers. He takes them out of darknesses to the light. Nazzal al-kitab. He sent down the book to guide them. So he takes them out of darkness into light. وَالَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ And those whom you call upon besides him, لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ نَصْرَكُمْ They cannot even help you. They're not able to help you. Allah is wali. Yatawalla. He befriends. He protects. He looks after. And He also guides. But those whom you're calling upon besides Allah, what kind of protection do they offer? What kind of help and assistance do they offer? Nothing. لا يستطيعون نصركم And on top of that, ولا أنفسهم ينصرون They cannot even help themselves. So why should you be concerned with them? Why should you take them as wali? وَإِن تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى الْهُدَى And if you invite them, meaning if you call upon these gods, if you call upon these false gods for guidance, what's going to happen? لا يسمعوا they do not hear. You make how much ever dua you want. How much ever dua. Longest duas you make before them. لا يسمعوا They will not listen. Because they don't have ears that can listen. وَتَرَاهُمْ And you can see these idols. يَنظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ As if they are looking at you. It is as though they are literally looking at you. Because they have huge eyes. وَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ But in reality they don't see at all. In reality, they don't see. It's just your illusion. It's just in your head. You think that they're looking, but in reality, they're not looking. Because if you go and touch their eye, if you go and break their eye, they cannot even defend themselves. So many times it has happened that people have constructed huge idols, big idols. But what happened to them? What happened to them eventually? Finished. Gone. If they were gods, they would be alive today. They would be present till today. Till today they would be present. If you ever learn about the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of them is the 
temple of one of the gods that people used to worship. Temple of Zeus, I believe. Huge idol made of ivory and gold. Ivory and gold. Where is it? Where is it? It's gone. You know what happened to it? An earthquake. Finished. And people stole the ivory and gold. Really? That happened to it. So if they cannot even help themselves, if they cannot even see, if they cannot even respond, then why should you call upon them? Why? When you are better than that idol, when you are better than that false god, when you are the best of creation that Allah has created, a human being with an intellect, with intelligence, then why should you submit to something that is lesser than you? You deserve to submit before the one supreme God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. This ayah has been understood in another way as well. That wa intadruhum, that if you call them, meaning, O believers, if you call the mushrikeen to guidance, la yasma'u, they do not listen. And what kind of listening is this? Of qubul, of acceptance. Meaning they do not accept your call. And it's not that they cannot listen. وَتَرَاهُمْ You see them. يَنظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ They see you and your truthfulness. وَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ Yet they don't see the reality. In Surah Fatir, Ayah 14, we learn, إِن تَدْعُوهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُوا دُعَاءَكُمْ If you invoke them, they do not hear your supplication. If you invoke them, they don't hear your supplication. وَلَوْ سَمِرُوا And even if they heard, مَسْتَجَابُوا لَكُمْ They would not respond to you because they cannot respond to you. They cannot respond to you. So why should you worship them? Why should you prostrate before them? Why should you associate them as partners with Allah? Allah alone is the one who gives benefit to you. He alone is the one who averts harm from you. So when it comes to asking for help, ask Him only. When it comes to thanking for a favor that you have received, thank Him. Because all good and harm comes from Him only. None but Him. We will listen to the recitation of these ayah. Nanna min ash We would be very grateful. But then when everything is okay, then what happens? We go thanking others. We go appreciating others. And we forget to thank Allah. We forget to appreciate Him. And this is the worst form of ingratitude. That we forget Allah, whereas He is the only one who helped us. He is the only one who gave that thing to us. He is the only one who averted that harm from us. And then we begin thinking about others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is complaining that who are you associating with me? Someone who cannot help you? Someone who doesn't even have eyes and ears? Someone who cannot respond to you? Who are you turning to? And these ayat are so effective for da'wah because many times people will worship the idols. Why? To get health, wealth, safety, security. But if you think about it, the one whom you're asking, does he have that himself even? The idol, does it have safety, security itself? It doesn't. It can be broken. It can be finished. It can get burnt. So much can happen to it. Then how can it give you health and safety and security? It's not possible. And a very important lesson for us, which is very relevant to us as well, that all benefit and harm comes from who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one else has the ability to bring any harm or benefit to you. And sometimes what happens, people instill fear in our hearts. And because of that, that if you don't do this, then some disaster is going to strike. If you do this, then you're going to get some benefit. Some miracle is going to happen. And sometimes we get emails and at the end it says, forward it so you can see a miracle happen. Forward it, otherwise you never know something bad might happen. Forward it so that something good can happen. And because of that fear, we fall prey to it and we forward it to everybody in our mailing list and we fill up other people's inboxes with junk as well. And as a result of that, it's in a way linking harm and benefit to somebody other than Allah. And that is a type of shirk. I remember somebody was mentioning once that how they forwarded one of such emails to someone and in their mailing list was a scholar as well. And they got an email from them that what you have done is incorrect. The email that you sent, it says, forward so that a miracle will happen. Miracles only happen 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to happen. Not by your sending emails. That's not what happens. So we have to be extremely careful when we forward emails. And many times women, they fall prey to this because every woman has this desire of having a child. And some people, they try a lot. Some women, they try a lot. And they just don't have any children. And people advise them that eat this or you know read such and such thing on this particular food and this particular water and then drink it or eat it in the middle of the night. And they prescribe many, many different types of prescriptions which are completely made up. Or go to this grave or make this promise that you will name the child such and such. You will give the child the name of Ali or the name of Hassan or the name of Hussein or something like that. And when you make this promise, then you will become pregnant. And sometimes it happens with people that they do something like this, which has an element of shirk in it, and they do expect a child very soon after that. So then they wonder, okay, what happened? The thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already destined a child for you. Whatever is written for you is going to happen. Just like the fish of the people of Ayla, they were written for them. Hitanuhum. Correct? Your risk is written for you. It's about how you get it. It's about what means you obtain in order to get it. Even if you didn't do anything, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given the child to you. But why should you use incorrect means? Incorrect means to get that child. Why? And sometimes because of social pressure, because of the fact that everybody has a child and I'm the only one left who doesn't have children. And people are advising me one thing after the other every single day. Because of that, women get influenced. But over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making sure that we don't make a major mistake over here. Whether it is calling on to the dead, or it is calling on to the idols, or it is anything or anyone like that. And that sometimes people will not make dua themselves, rather they will go to righteous people that you make dua for us. That because you are up there, because you are more righteous, your dua will be accepted. And in fact, there is actually a difference of opinion amongst the scholars whether it is permissible to ask someone to make dua for you. You know that? Some scholars say that it's not permissible to ask another to make dua for you. It's not permissible. So how is it possible that we don't make dua ourselves and we go to another person who is also a human being and you expect that because they will pray istikhara, they will do something because of that, you will have a child? Whatever is written for you is going to happen. All benefit and loss comes from Allah only. So if you want something, ask Him only. And we have been told earlier that on the Day of Judgment, nobody will have an excuse because we have been told from before. So here we have been told very clearly. And if something like this has been done in the past by someone because of ignorance, because of being overcome by emotions, that they had a very traumatic experience with the baby or with the birth of the child and they forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they forgot to thank him now is the time to do tawbah and repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his names and that if you look at it before the idols are mentioned before the false gods are mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the fact that he has beautiful names beautiful names and if you call upon Allah by those beautiful names then you don't need to call upon anybody else you don't but that's if you know the names if you call upon him by those names and you can't claim to love someone unless and until you know their name we will listen to the recitation of these ayah قل لا املك لنفسي نفعا ولا ضرا الا ما شاء الله ولو كنت أعلم الغيب لاستكثرت من الخير و...